most of the Jews felt that it was disrespectful to be speaking Hebrew day by day. It was a language that was supposed to be for prayer. Eliezer ben Yehuda would say, you think the prophets didn't go to the bathroom? You think they didn't take out the garbage? (laughs) This is the Book of Life. I'm Heidi Rabinowitz. The Language of Angels is a picture book about the modern revival of the Hebrew language. I met with author Rich Michelson at his art gallery in Northampton, Massachusetts, to talk about the book and to learn more about the gallery, too. Tell us about the language of angels. All right. So the language of angels is a story about, as it says, the reinvention of Hebrew. I mean, to me, this is fascinating. It's a book about Hebrew, but it's really, for me, a book about my love of language itself, playing with language and learning with language. We tend to all think, and especially children think, that language is something that is given from on high. You know, there are rules. We go to class and we hear about grammar and everything has a rule and everything has to be done right. And it's no wonder that we grow up not realizing that language is a living, breathing organism. It changes constantly. Uh, Words are made up by real people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Usage changes. You know, as a poet, that's my interest in language. I want kids to read this book, adults to read this book, and learn to play with language and use it. It should be fun. It should be exciting. The backstory is really that Hebrew was a dead language. It died out as a day-to-day tongue around the time of the Maccabees over 2,000 years ago. In a sense, it would be like us going to Italy today and within a couple of generations getting everybody to speak Latin again. Uh (laughs) Uh, It's not going to happen. It's a dream, right? right? But in fact, the reinvention of Hebrew was more unlikely. When Eliezer ben Yehuda, who is our hero of the book, as well as his son, it's told through his son's viewpoint, uh, he wanted all Jews to have a common language. When he went to the Promised Land, then it was Palestine. He considered himself a Jerusalemite. This is, you know, at the beginning of a movement back to the Promised Land in the late 1800s. Jews were coming from all over, and they didn't have a common language. Many of them spoke Yiddish, but Eliezer and a number of Jews felt that Yiddish was a language of defeat, not a place to start to build a new society. But mostly Turkish was spoken, Russian was spoken, English was spoken. It was a real conglomerate of languages. But Hebrew was only used for prayers. And so it had solidified in that way. And there were no words for anything that had happened in 2,000 years. Could you imagine that? Having to make up words for bicycles, for ice cream, all these things that didn't exist in the time of the prophets. I used to think as a kid that it would be so much fun to be Adam and name all the animals. Mm -hmm. Never occurred to me how much work that would be. (laughs) Uh, He had to put everything down in a dictionary. First, of course, he had to coin a term, a Hebrew word for dictionary, because there had been none. He had to teach it in schools, of course, had to coin terms for schools. So he developed the first Hebrew dictionary, and it was really through the children. And I talk in the book about how he came to that revelation to get Hebrew from the ground up. Most of the adults thought, of course, this was a Meshuggah idea. (laughs) Um, And in fact, the Jews were more against it than anyone. The Jews who were there very much disliked Eliezer ben Yehuda. They banned it against him. In fact, many of his closest allies were the Arabs who had already been there. He would explain to them how Hebrew and Arabic were sister languages. They shared a lot of root words and grew up together. So in a sense, he considered the Arab people his family, his mishpacha, and they supported him, and he would give talks about the roots of Arabic and Hebrew. They loved hearing Hebrew spoken again in the marketplace. But most of the Jews 
felt that it was disrespectful to be speaking Hebrew day by day. It was a language that was supposed to be preserved for holiness, for prayer, not day by day. And as I mentioned in the book, Eliezer ben Yehuda would say, you think the prophets didn't go to the bathroom? You think they didn't take out the garbage? Because this is the argument. You know, you can't say I'm going to the bathroom in Hebrew. Right. So they thought he was basically nuts. Mm -hmm. um, and he was basically nuts. That's the background of this story. How do you go about inventing these words? He studied Greek. He studied Latin. He studied Arabic. He studied the uh, Torah and the Talmud to find roots of words. So if he was looking for ice cream, was there a word somewhere that meant something was cold? And how do you add on to that? He wanted his son to be the very first native Hebrew speaker in 2,000 years. And that's where my story comes in. So his son, Ben Zion, he insisted he would only hear Hebrew language. He would not allow anyone to speak within his presence in any language but Hebrew. He went so far, and this is true, to keep him away from animals. He didn't want him to hear dogs barking. He didn't want him to hear cows mooing. Basically, this is child abuse. Yeah. And Ben Zayin did not learn to speak until he was older than most kids. The neighbors thought it was child abuse. His wife, unhappily, had to go along with him. We can look at it a little more kindly nowadays because we know how Ben Zion grew up. Mm -hmm. We know he did eventually learn to speak. He did follow his father into the language game. He became a scholar of the Hebrew language. When he grew up, almost as crazily, uh, he started championing the language Esperanto. Just as his dad wanted all Jews to speak one language, thinking mm -hmm. it would bring them together, mm -hmm. he felt that if all people shared a common language, uh, that would bring them together. Now, that sounds crazy, too. Right. But is it any crazier than his dad's? Right. No. Right. Passion. Yeah. Um, and just as a sideline for your listeners, one of my fun things. I think I was on your podcast the last time I was talking about my book, Fascinating, yes. The Life of Leonard Nimoy. And the only major Hollywood film that was filmed entirely in Esperanto actually starred William Shatner. No way. Uh, so <laughs> there's a connection for you. You can, well, I forget the title, but you can go watch the film entirely in Esperanto. His son grew up to idolize his dad. He wrote a biography of him. So we go a little easier on Eliezer Ben Yehuda because he was successful right. in his it turned out okay. kind of passion. Um, How did you, you first learn about passion. him? I first learned about him, actually, through Neil Waldman. This was more than 15 years ago. Uh, Neil had been hired to illustrate my book, Too Young for Yiddish. And during the writing of that book, I learned that Yiddish was considered the only language without a word for weapons. <laughs> and Isaac Bashev, singer, used to say that all the time. And Neil and I were having lunch, and we were talking about that idea. And I remember asking him if there were no words for weapons. Do you think that that influenced the Yiddish culture? Or did the Yiddish culture influence the language? Of course, that's, you know, where does language come from? What comes first? And do you think that if we got rid of certain words, we'd have a more peaceful society? Anyways, two guys sitting around the table. We had just finished the book, just talking about philosophy. And I don't remember his answer to my question. But I do remember that he brought up the uh, story of Eliezer ben Yehuda. And he said to me, I have been trying to write this story for quite some time, and I haven't figured out a way in. So I give you this story as a gift. <laughs> How nice. And I said, thanks a lot. I got enough uh, <laughs> aggravation, uh -huh. enough to do. And I couldn't think of a way in either. How do you make this accessible to children? Where's the hook? And I couldn't think of one, and I just put it away. I 
totally forgot about it. And coming back to my fascinating book, a few years back, while I was writing that book, I decided to go to a Star Trek convention. It was not my cup of tea. <laughs> uh, but uh, somebody came up to me, speaking to me in Klingon. <laughs> and they had a child with them who was about four years old. And the kid started talking to me, showing off and speaking in Klingon, which is a oh, language, right? Awesome. Yeah. And I turned to the kid and I said, are you going to be the first native Klingon speaker? And boom, all of a sudden, it was like I was thunderstruck. I had my way in mm -hmm. through the story of Ben Zion being the first native speaker. How does that happen? How do you learn a language when... Nobody else around you speaks it. How do you grow up with friends when you can't talk to anyone? The first page says, once there was a child without a friend. So how do you use language to have fun, to build a life, to make friends? That was my way in. You know, as a writer, and I know that many of your listeners are writers, certainly readers, it's always fascinating to me how one project leads to another, how it comes back into mind, into view. Who thought that 15 plus years ago, an idea that I had abandoned would come back to me in such a circuitous route? Mm -hmm. That's the wonder about being a writer. You have no idea what's coming next. So it's wonderful. That's so cool. Why is Hebrew considered to be the language of angels? That is how Eliezer ben Yehuda tried to champion, tried to get people interested in Hebrew when they would say it's only the language for prayer that was passed down to us in the holy books. He would call it the language of angels and teach kids. And it really was the children who taught the adults, not the other way around. Within his lifetime, something like 55 schools opened, teaching only in Hebrew in 1948. It was called the official language. I mean, this was amazing that this happened in one man's lifetime. Incredible. What a story. Yeah, it is. Ah, I knew nothing <laughs> about this story. I researched it through Eliezer Ben Yehuda's work, his son's work, and fortunately his grandson, also named Eliezer Ben Yehuda, also a rabbi, lives in Florida, and was very helpful to me, beginning just reading his own biography of his grandfather. But before the book was published, I did send him a draft. He caught some nice, embarrassing mistakes oh, um, that had to do with the language itself. It was great that he was enthusiastic about the book. Yeah, that's a wonderful endorsement. Uh -huh. Let's talk about the illustrations. Let's. Yes. Okay. So this book is illustrated by my dear friend, Carla Goodian, who is absolutely perfect for this book. It can be a difficult subject. Carla makes it fun. The colors are fun. The illustrations are geared towards younger kids. There's highlighted Hebrew words in it that match highlighted words in the text. Carla does speak Hebrew. That was a help. I was lucky to get her. Many people don't realize that the illustrator is not the author's prerogative. I sell my story, and it is then in the publisher's hands. In many cases, because of my day job, where I represent many great children's illustrators. It's odd for me because my illustrators often bring in books they're working on and I help advise them on the illustrations. I think like an illustrator, mm -hmm. but I can't draw. <laughs> and yet when somebody's working on my books, it's a bit more difficult. I have to try to give them more space. I was very fortunate in this case that I suggested Carla to the publisher and they looked at her work and they loved it. We have wanted to work together for many, many years. So this was a great fun for us to come together because we're friends. And, of course, I represent her in my gallery. So I get to look at her work all the time. Go to my website, rmichelson.com. R-M-I-C-H-E-L-S-O-N.com is the gallery website. And if you look under illustrations, 
you can find Carla's work there. Excellent. Let's talk about the gallery. So sure. give us an overview of what it is, what it does, how you got started. Well, everybody can come and visit me. We are the first gallery in the country that ever featured children's book illustration on an equal footing to so-called fine art. We did not start out doing children's books. It's beautiful on the center of Main Street in Northampton, but you can visit us online as well. You're here now, so you see we have beautiful marble floors and 60-foot ceilings. We represent over 200 artists Many of your audience's favorite illustrators, Mordecai Gerstein, Maurice Sendak, Dr. Seuss, we handle the estate, Mo Willems, many, uh, I shouldn't keep mentioning names because I'll leave out too many, Uh, (laughs) I'll throw in Jerry Pinckney. We probably have, I think, what is it, about 25 of our artists have won Caldecott honors or medals. On six occasions, the Caldecott was given And that artwork for the book happened to be hanging in the gallery at the time. That's kind of fun. Uh, We raised prices quickly. (laughs) Just kidding. So we're certainly the premier gallery in the country selling children's book illustration art. I've been doing this for 40 years. We started an annual show 29 years ago. Every November and December, we turn the entire gallery over to book illustration. People come from all over the world. Illustrators come from all over the country. It's a great party. You're all welcome. Go on our website and sign up for the mailing list, and you will get an invitation. It's probably the largest gathering of book illustrators and authors in the country. When we started, there was absolutely no interest in illustration as a fine art. No museums were interested at all. I can say that we sold very little. But over the years, it has changed year by year. Now it is our most well-attended show of the year. I probably curate 15 to 20 exhibitions at museums around the world every year. I just got back from an exhibition of Caldecott Art in South Korea. We work very closely with my good friends at the Eric Carl Museum, which is five miles away. We're on many of the same bus tours. We often feature artists together. We're 20 minutes away from the Dr. Seuss National Memorial. We supply them with Dr. Seuss's work. We're also not too far from, we're about an hour from the Norman Rockwell Museum. So we consider ourselves the epicenter of book illustration. So many authors and illustrators live within a stone's throw of the gallery. It's really become a meeting place over the years. It's just wonderful. And I've been pleased to have a few of my illustrators illustrate my books. Mm -hmm. E.B. Lewis, Mm -hmm. Raul Colon. We also represent the great Leonard Baskin, who did the National Holocaust Memorial. And our other Leonard is Leonard Nimoy, who is an amazing photographer. His book, Shekinah, is about the intersection of religion, spirituality, and sexuality. Of course, he was a dear friend of mine, as I think a lot of your listeners probably know. So for me, it's wonderful because all my interests combine right here at this desk that I'm sitting at. Yeah, that's so wonderful. So speaking of Hebrew, Tikkun Olam is Hebrew for repairing the world. How does the language of angels help repair the world? We are now taping this in June 2017, uh, where we are all dealing with what many of us thought we were well past in our lifetimes, an administration that treats language as a way to spread untruths instead of treating language as a path to truth. In many ways, politicians and poets and writers both use language to try to persuade and change. I think that treating language the way Eliezer Ben Yehuda did, the way I hope I do, the way poets do, to bring it back to what it means. Eliezer Ben Yehuda did not find these words offhand. He studied the roots of words. It was very important what they meant. Also, while he was in the middle of, uh, of the Zionist movement, trying to bring more Jews to the Holy Land, he also was reaching out to his neighbors. He wanted everyone to live in peace. He wanted them to share the land. And he wanted to do that, as I mentioned before, through showing everyone their common roots. 
the books that we all go back to together, how our stories come from the same root often. And in a sense, we are brothers and sisters with those who we need to share both the Holy Land and this land of immigrants Mm -hmm. with. Eliezer ben Yehuda was an immigrant into the land of Israel. Uh, Leonard Nimoy's family came to this country as immigrants. His mother escaped a pogrom by hiding in a hay cart and being pulled out of Zaslev, Ukraine. His father had to escape the country's well pogroms. These people who we've learned to admire and look up to in this country were given opportunities as the children of immigrants, the opportunity to see their vision come to life. They repaired as best they could their little corner of the world. I'm hoping through these books to spread the stories of people like Ben Yehuda, of Nimoy, my other books on uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel and Martin Luther King coming together to further social justice causes. Obviously, that is important for me in almost all my books. They either deal with repairing the world with social justice or with a love of language. Some are just kind of fun, silly poetry, playing with words. So for me, this book is important because it brings a lot of my interests together. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about that I haven't thought to ask you? Nope. (laughs) No, I mean, you know, you got me started. Once you get me started, it's hard to stop. Um, You know, I'm thrilled that you were able to come here. We've done this over the phone before. I love sitting across the desk from you. It's a lot more fun. And I thank you. I thank your audience. You've all been more than kind to me over the many years. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. Great. Next time, we'll hear from the creators of the Israeli fantasy movie, The Last Shepherd. I've been sitting on this interview for over a year, since before we started doing dedications, waiting to see if the film would become available in the U.S. It hasn't. So here's your mission, should you choose to accept it. Start bugging your local Jewish film festival and your local Comic-Con to screen The Last Shepherd by Evil Sun Productions. And tune in next time to hear all about the film. If you enjoy the Book of Life podcast, please become a patron at patreon.com slash bookoflife. Leave a review on iTunes or a comment on our blog at bookoflifepodcast.com. You can also like our page at facebook.com slash bookoflifepodcast. Follow us at twitter.com slash bookoflifepod. Email us at bookoflifepodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail. 561-206-2473. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida at cbiboca.org and is supported in part by the Association of Jewish Libraries at jewishlibraries.org. Our background music is provided by the Freilach Makers Klezmer String Band. Thanks for listening and happy reading.